Well, hello, thank you for joining us again on the Church History Trail, and we're continuing now in the museum here at the fort, the indoor exhibition at uh, Charles Fort at Conceal. And so we're upstairs now, and you can see a big chest of drawers there. And it's, I think that's Lieutenant. Ponson Bay, I think it says, 4th Cluster Regiment. So there you are. Of course, this was a British Army base for about 200 years. And that's why you're seeing the uniforms, etc. That's Busby, World War One. So there you are. Some chair there, that's like a bed chair. It is actually. Folds out there as you can see. Let's see what it says about it. It's mid Victorian. A campaign bed, yeah, for the army. Probably for the officers, I would assume. And there's a wee. That sort of gives you an idea of what it would be like in here. As you can see. At least they had the, the hearth to keep them warm there, the good light of fire, which was good. That's the Fort Hospital. As you can see. There's a complete history. So if you want to pause the, visit, the, the video and read that, you can if you're interested. And that's the soldier's wife. My goodness, she's loading the cannon. <laughs> it says there, until the mid 19th century, the British army frowned upon marriage, regarding it as a hindrance to absolute loyalty and obedience. This position was reflected by the restrictions on the number of soldiers wives permitted in a unit, only six soldiers in every hundred chosen by drawing lots were allowed to marry on the strength and I'm going to read a wee bit more of this. Murray quarters were not generally provided in the British Army until the mid 19th century. Up until then the soldier's wife had little option but to share barrack accommodation with her husband's regiment. The only provision made for the couple's privacy was a blanket curtain. The soldier's wife was expected to perform certain duties such as washing, mending clothes, cooking and cleaning the barrack rooms in return for free rations. There were no regulations to prohibit a soldier marrying off the strength, but there was little to recommend such a union. Off the strength, wives were not allowed into the barracks, nor were the husbands permitted to live outside with them. They received no food rations, or, r food rations or allowances. Despite the hardship of military service, some women chose a life in the army. Captain Molly was a young Irish woman, commissioned as a sergeant by General George Washington. Oh, there you are for taking the place of her dead husband at the Battle of Monmouth in 1778 during the American War of Independence. Very good. And so I assume that's her there. I would assume, and I'll have, have a wee look and see what number that is. Yes, Captain Molly during the American War of Independence. There you go, that's Captain Molly. Fantastic. There you can see a wee photo on the wall there. Some of the British soldiers. And then this is the last part of the exhibition. And there's muskets and all here. So this is earlier history then of the fort. It says there in 1690, the people of Conceal refused to profess loyalty to William of Orange despite his victories over the Jacobite armies at Derry, the Boyne and Cork. And then it says the Jacobites realized the importance of holding Conceal to safeguard contact with their principal ally France. 
the Williamite campaign against Conceal under the joint command of the Duke of Marlborough and Wurttemberg was short and sharp. The 70-year-old Jacobite commander, Sir Edward Scott, sat fire to the town of Conceal and withdrew with 1,700 men to Charles Fort. Colonel O'Driscoll withdrew with 450 soldiers to James Fort. So there you go. There's the cannonballs. The Siege of Conceal, 1690. Very good. That's a trooper. Now it says Marlborough assigned the task of taking James Fort to his officers, Tattoo, who I mentioned earlier, and Fitzpatrick. And another wee video I showed you uh, a painting that Tattoo's actually f his family had donated to the museum here. It says their daring assault with a force of 800 men on the night of 3rd of October 1690 took the defenders by surprise. An explosion in the gunpowder magazine during the attack forced the Jacobite garrison to surrender. When Scott refused to surrender Charles Fort, Marlborough began preparations for a siege. Six 24-pounder cannons and two mortars were placed in a battery overlooking Charles Fort and opened fire on 12th of October. Three days later, a breach was made and the Jacobite def defenders called for a truce. The, of the officers surrendered honourably and Scott was able to negotiate favourable terms. And then it says many of, the Scots, of Scott's men went to Limerick to support the Jacobite forces under the command of Patrick Sarsfield. So there you are. There's Louis. I think, I think that's Louis XIV. Oh, let me just check. No, it's not. It's Richard Talbot, <laughs> Earl of Tyrconnell. No, that's Daphne James II. And that's the Battle of the Boyne. So that's how we read of this one. Now it says, the 1690 siege of Charles Fort was part of a war between, fought between William of Orange and James II over the English crown. James II's attempts to re-establish Catholicism caused resentment among the Anglican aristocracy. William married to James's, James' eldest daughter, Mary, promised to safeguard Protestant political and religious privileges. When William invaded England in 1688, James sought exile in Catholic France. The vacant throne was offered to William and Mary in the so-called Glorious Revolution. The Irish Parliament accepted James as the legitimate king of uh, the, the Irish Parliament accepted James as the legitimate king of Ireland. Irish support for King William was confined to the Protestants of Ulster. Richard Talbot, Earl of Draconnell, James II's Catholic, James II's Catholic Lord Deputy, led the Jacobite Irish resistance. And of course, we were at the castle, his 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 ancestral castle. Um, where he li where he was, uh, he had breakfast on the morning. If you remember, with uh, the his family, the, the uh, Talbot family, and about about thirteen or fourteen of them, and only he was the only one that survived at the end of the Battle of the Boyne. The rest were uh, killed, and so that's Malahide Castle. So you can watch out for that wee video. And it says he was a support. He was supported by the French commander. I'm not even going to try and pronounce that. And then it says the Williamite forces in Ireland were led by the Duke of Schomburg and his ally, the Danish commander, the Duke of Württemberg. And there's a wee screen that you can watch. And there's more. Again, that's William's victory at the Battle of the Boyne. And there's more you can read there as well. If you want to pause the video and read those, you can. And then there's some muskets. Now, I was a reenactor, so I should know what these are. Although my period was the American Civil War, mostly. But that's a bolt action there, that one. And that one there is a percussion cap. And then that one there is actually a flint lock. And before that, you had the match lock, but there's no match lock here. But uh, if you've ever heard of the flush in the palm, well, the flesh in the pan actually clump comes from the flint lock, lock musket because whenever it, it was struck, the flint was struck, sparks ended up in the pan, which ignited the gunpowder, which propelled the ball then out of the end of the barrel. And so that's where you get the term flesh in the pan from the flint lock musket. Now, the percussion cap, the percussion cap, when it came in, the... Uh, French pattern. It was, it was more accurate. The uh, percussion cap musket than 
the flintlock, and one of the big reasons for that was because of rifling in the barrel, uh, where the flintlock was a smooth bore, the percussion cap was a rifle, had rifling in the barrel, and it was really the start of the mini ball, which sort of the modern bullet, and it was named after a general, a French general called Minet, and that's why you called it the mini ball, which wasn't a ball, but it was, it's what we would call the shape or at least sort of the shape of a modern bullet. And uh, so these were more accurate then, the, flint, the uh, percussion cap, because of the uh, rifling in the bullets, uh, in the barrels, whereas the flintlocks were smoothbore. And so the idea with the flintlocks was, and even with the matchlocks, was you lined up men in a row, and hopefully out of all those rows, some will reach their targets. But with the percussion cap and the rifling, um, that was more accurate, but they were still using those Napoleonic tactics, even during the American Civil War. And uh, so what happened was you got more casualties, although most soldiers did die of lead poisoning, rather than from the actual bullet. Um, but also a lot of people don't realise, but they actually had the Gatlin gun, which was a type of an early machine gun during the American Civil War. Why they never made more use of it, I do not know. But there you go. So thank you for joining me. And uh, I'll give you a wee view out the windows here. It would blow you away today. It was really bad today. I'm not. I'm not joking you. I was near blue, blue down. And um, I think that's Charles or James Fort over there on that wee hill there where we're going. But we'll not be going there yet because the weather is really bad, as you can hear. So thanks for joining me today again on the Church History Trail and thanks for watching. And I've also lost my hat because the hat blew clean off my head. So good job my head wasn't on it at the time. <laughs> God bless.